if you're not really an author at heart, I'm not talking about a skill set, I'm talking about your love for the thing, then do something else. Because if you work for one of the big publishers in air quotes and you sell copyright, mm -hmm. you may get 7% of wholesale. And that means if your book goes to, 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 to market for $10, Wholesale is $4.50. So 7% of $4.50, you do the math. And that's before you go in the hole in terms of debt with the particular publisher. Advances, that. how many books you have to purchase. And so the big publishers, they're there's that. Of course, you can negotiate all of that. But then people who do proper self-publishing, yeah, you can increase your royalty share to 60, 70%. Uh, but... Yeah, how many books are you going to sell? So you need to figure out. In my mind, there's there are 12 good ways to 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 utilize that same book. Right. For income. And so if it's about income for you, then just writing a book is not going to cut it. I promise you. Happy Wednesday, my winners and goal getters. Welcome back to the Getting the Win show. I am your host, Melissa T, the procrastination bully. Thank you as always for tuning in. And if this is your first time, then welcome. <laughs> um, today's interview is going to be very specifically focused. I'll be speaking with L. David Harris about the sort of the publishing process. So if you're someone who you've seen some of my videos on Instagram or on Facebook about getting your book done, this is the conversation that gets into some of those brass tacks in terms of how to do it. You know, L. David is going to share his experience with the publishing industry. He is a very prolific writer and author. So he shares his story here, shares some practical tips that you can use. And as I mentioned towards the end of the interview, hey, if you have any questions, drop them in the comments or DM me on Instagram at Getting the Wind Show. I'll be glad to answer any of those things or clarify those things for you. But in the meantime, enjoy. As promised, I've got the one and only L. David Harris with me in the virtual building. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to welcome to the show, man. Thanks so much for taking the time. Listen, it's an investment. I didn't take anything. I, I just I just want to be in the room with you. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, L. David Harris, my my sort of alter ego, as he calls me, <laughs> the female <laughs> female alter ego. We're like brother and sister it is so dope um mm -hmm. but i brought uh l david on because we wanted to like focus on the the importance of prioritization you guys saw me talk about on episode i want to say three or four the different ways to prioritize your tasks and using the you know the stephen covey quadrant in terms of priorities but you know l david is somebody that is as he calls himself a swiss army knife he's done a lot <laughs> over the many years so like let's let's start off with that you know l david like how do you normally how do you normally keep compartmentalize all your priorities and make sure you get everything done that you promised yourself you would get done for the day okay for a day that's what i was wondering uh yeah for yeah. the day it depends if i'm promising to me then i put that lower on the team. Okay. If I'm promising like that to Melissa T at you know 12 noon, I'm gonna deliver a project, mm -hmm. then I'm going to make sure that everything that I need to do to make sure I hit that target because I promised to you mm -hmm. that that's what I do. So I prioritize based on whether it's internal or internal or external. I don't minimize myself, but I do prioritize clients because you would have paid me more most of the time. And if you haven't paid me, my word matters so much that since I said, I'm going to meet you at this time, or I'm going to deliver X at this time, that's what it has to be. So it's based on a promise most of the time. That's an important, that's an important gem right there in terms of prioritizing what you want to do for yourself versus what your clients are doing. If you're, you know, if you're watching and you're an entrepreneur. You probably already do that, but that's all right. Like we're, we're reinforcing, <laughs> we're reinforcing. Um, wanted to get your thoughts because you've been an entrepreneur for quite some time. Like you started many, many businesses. <laughs> He's like, just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. So talk about your evolution though, as an entrepreneur and how, 
how have you seen yourself become more laser focused with each business venture? How have you seen yourself like improve your performance for your clients over the years? Yeah. So I think my first foray into entrepreneurialism was when I was 19. Wow. And that's, and that's you know, that's absent the street hustle. Like, you know, I was one of those guys. Like I, I sold, I sold my services as a lock picker, like when I was <laughs> 17. So I taught people how to pick locks. We're not talking that about okay. that kind of stuff. People we're talking that, that's, about, that's like, the dirty consultant. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this dirty. is, this is the stuff you can report to the IRS. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but no, I, I, when I was in university, I had already been, so I guess by by then uh four years as like sort of a hood barber right in air quotes mm -hmm. unofficial right and unofficial yeah after freshman year in university though i needed money like most of us do mm -hmm. and one of the people that whose hair i used to cut said hey i know somebody with a salon in 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 uh silver spring maryland uh right on 16th street so uh hey i can hook you up and so my first space as an entrepreneur was as a barber in Montgomery County, Maryland, when nice. I was 19 years of age. And of course, there's this thing called booth rent. You have to mm -hmm. pay to be in the space. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn like early that, listen, if I don't earn enough, then I'm not going to be able to afford the space to work. That and part. even in those days, I mean, I'm, I'm 50. So we're talking about a long time ago. Okay. Uh, even in those days, I had to figure out, like, how in the world am I going to make the booth rent so that this makes sense? Mm -hmm. And I've done so many things since then. It's ridiculous. I don't think we have that kind of time. But <laughs> it was always yeah. about, like, what was the most effective use and efficient use of the who of who I am mm -hmm. at the time that I found myself? So. Okay. I'm done with being a barber, and then I go into the mental health field, but that's obviously a W-2 type employment or working for someone. Mm -hmm. But I always kept that I need to be able to earn on the side for me mindset. Interesting. So I did that juggling thing or attempted to do the juggling thing that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs who were probably kind of fearful of losing that, fr that uh, steady money do. Mm-hmm. And I did that all the way until uh, about 13 years ago. I stopped juggling about 13 years ago. Yeah. And, and the reason, because I prioritize family Ooh. above most things. I said, okay, well, I need, in order to keep my family together, I'm almost 40 at the time, or whatever how long <laughs> that was. And I needed to have my son home with me employer wasn't cooperating with my proposal. So after 13-ish uh, years in higher education by that, at that time, I said, okay, well, I'm gonna have to hang out my shingle. This is it. This is it with the juggling thing. Mm -hmm. And so family is, a, a, you know, part of the core of what makes the most make sense in my life because mm -hmm. my family growing up was not a good thing. And I said, the one that I create needs to be balanced. And there was a conflict. So I said, okay, entre full entrepreneurship for me. Yeah. Awesome. And talk a little bit how, about how you came to that conclusion. Was it a thing where you were like carving out time in the mornings to kind of self-assess? Were you doing it at night? How did you essentially go from like, okay, I'm working this W-2 job 13 years. And then, you know what? I have a family now. Time to toss deuces. Like, how did you... What was your process of self-assessing? Well, a good thing was that I was already a writer, a professional writer, and, mm -hmm. and, and not a starving artist. I mean, I was actually earning as a, as a writer from 1996. So by this time, 13 years ago, so you know I had been doing something for a good while. And then I had launched other businesses, too, in the interim. And so part of my model was using my time wisely. So you talk about the morning and evening. When I wrote my first few books, that's exactly what I was doing. I was getting up, I think in those years, like five o'clock in the morning. And so mm -hmm. sometime before I went to work, I would write. And then at lunchtime, I would write. And then in the evening. And then periodically, I would take time in the, on the weekends to go away to just... Mm-hmm. 
in order to, to, to do that. And so that was very helpful to me. And um, also, I was just looking for new ventures. So at the time that I had resigned from higher education, right before then, I was supposed to run my friend's uh, HR company. Back then, wow. it was a thing like, wow, you're going to outsource human resources? Now it's, you know, it's passe. But then it was just like, whoa. And so there were opportunities like those that kept coming to me to say, okay, for a short time, you can do this. Boom. And I would go in and do this, whether it's a year, two years, or something like that, or on a task basis. And mm -hmm. so I got my hands into a lot of things. And time is never a thing for me because I would, it's, it's either before work, during lunch, or after work. And the gotcha. weekends, it wasn't really a big thing because I, I didn't I didn't believe in working through the weekend. Mm. So I really that's, had to maximize those three times or else no money for me. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a gem, too. Like for those of you who are either part of the hustle culture and working seven days a week or six and you want more time for yourself, the key is to. Like it's possible to work fewer hours. You just have to make the most of your work week by making more time in some cases, you know what I mean? Getting up a little bit earlier, going to bed a little bit later um, and reclaiming your weekends because Absolutely. like firsthand, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> firsthand experience of burnout, y'all don't do it. <laughs> or, yeah, and, and I learned yeah. about passive income at the time too. So, so yeah, know, talk about that because that, bu that buys back your freedom too. Exactly. And so uh, I guess I was 21 when I first, well, not first heard it because my sister, you know, went well before me in the 1980s, right? But for me, when I was 21, that's when I learned about passive income. And I was like, wait a minute, passive income. So that means that I can do some work, maximize the time and continually get paid. And it's like, okay, well, you're thinking about network marketing. That's one way. But mm -hmm. royalty income is like passive income as well. Mm -hmm. And so me being an author, uh, also a voiceover person, and I would have certain kinds of contracts where, you know, you, you, you put the work in today and then for a period of time, whatever the prescribed period of time was, then you would still earn whatever the agreed amount was. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of thing helps to, to maximize time because right now, like somebody may be buying one of the bazillions of books that I've touched or written or voiced. And then, you know, net 30, you know, after they would have purchased it 30 days later, then I'll see whatever my percentage is for that particular type of work. So I, I really, I really started to treasure passive income for that purpose, for that reason. Awesome. And talk, talk about that. Let, like, let's transition into that specific industry because you, you are a prolific writer, prolific author, and the voice stuff. So talk about that process of the first book you published. Like, let's go there. <laughs> and oh, <wow>. then, yeah. <laughs> like, how, how did that feel having your first book published, like going from ideation to publication and having the physical thing? Okay, well, yeah. So here's the story <laughs> on that one. You say first book. <laughs> okay, yeah. so I wasn't a very disciplined writer. And what okay. I mean by that uh, is I didn't know how long a book should or should not be. Mm -hmm. So, like, I wrote an encyclopedia, except it wasn't an encyclopedia. <laughs> and, and the, and the self-publisher, I mean, we're talking about a, a, a legitimate company who takes all of the work off of your plate except for the writing part and then mm -hmm. pushes it into the market. And so it's not me out of my trunk. It's distributed just like, you know, a lot of the, 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 the books that you would have known before. They were like, yeah, too many pages, bro. Mm -mm. This is not going to work out. It's too many pages. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what you mean by it's too many pages? <laughs> <laughs> so that yeah, because they, they, even though I paid, they still could say no. And so I cut it in half and made it two books. Right. Ooh, okay. But each of the books were still nearly 300 pages. Yeah, but I loved having it because I came up in a publishing household. My, 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 my father was in publishing, even though he's a he was estranged, mm -hmm. but like he came up, he was, he was in the publishing industry when I was a young boy. 
Wow. And so I would read things like we're supposed to spread this kind of whatever it was that we were writing, like the leaves of autumn. And then when I got the like the bug in 96 and said, wait a minute, like I can actually write. Hmm. Well, let me write. And I would I would print stuff at Kinko's. Yeah. And then pass it out. You know, I'd pass out, you know, a thousand words, two thousand words at work. And uh, but by the time I, I, I published the first two books, they came out simultaneously. I was actually at a Christian writers conference in Northeast Maryland. And it was like the premier writers conference of the time for Christian writers, authors. And, you know, we had literary agents and, and publishers you would know of and some like authors you would know. And my book came out, the first two books came out right while I was at a writer's conference. So you can imagine that was like, whoa, this is amazing. And uh, then I just got addicted to it. I did that uh, several times over. And then I started to set a goal of a couple of books per year. Nice. Because I was more introverted than I am now. Mm -hmm. And all I did was write. I just wrote, 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 wrote. Ta -ta 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 -ta. So I have female pseudonyms and a whole bunch of other stuff that, you know, <laughs> it, it may not say my name on it, but I promise it's me. It's me. Hello. It's me. Uh, because because that matters to me because I know it will outlast me. Mm -hmm. Like I'll be long gone and these words will still be in the minds and hearts of people. So it's, gra it's more gratifying than a lot of things that I've done, quite frankly. Um, and in terms of what you mentioned before, in terms of the royalties, do you find that part gratifying? Like, in, is it worth it? Because I know, you know, for those who are interested in writing books, they, you know, the common knowledge tends to be like, ah, the royalties aren't going to be that great. You probably want to complement that with speaking and coaching or, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, you, want a, you want a clinic on this or you just want a quick answer? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I have worked for multiple publishers and mm -hmm. even historic publishers back to the 1800s. And I have, I have a publishing company. And so what I do is, is advise my authors that if you are not really about this literary life, then go find something else to do. Mm. I just start with the apathy, like go find something else to do. Because I remember when the market became, became saturated with individuals who were using it for marketing, like, like marketing people and no diss to marketing. Cause I've done that before I've done that. Um, but it was just like, get as many books out into the marketplace as you can so you can increase your revenues. Mm -hmm. And so it started to me, it started to sort of water down what it meant to be an author because there, there was a lot more rubbish in the marketplace. And then I said, okay, if you're not really an author at heart, I'm not talking about a skill set. I'm talking about your love for the thing, then do something else. Because if you work for one of the big publishers in air quotes and you sell copyright, Mm -hmm. You may get 7% of wholesale. And that means if your book goes to, 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 to market for $10, wholesale is $4.50. So 7% of $4.50, you do the math. And that's before you go in the hole in terms of debt <laughs> with the particular publisher. Advances, yeah. how many books you have to purchase. And so the big publishers, they're there's that. Of course, you can negotiate all of that. But then people who do proper self-publishing, yeah, you can increase your royalty share to 60, 70%. Uh, but yeah, how many books are you going to sell? So you need to figure out, in my mind, there's, there are 12 good ways to, to, to utilize that same book right. for income. And so if it's about income for you, then just writing a book is not going to cut it. I promise you. Not for most people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And like with mentioning that, can you give us like four or five of them? We ain't, okay. we ain't giving them all 12, but like just like four or five different ways that they can parlay a book into different revenue sources. Yeah. So I see a bookcase behind you. So that first one is the one that you see behind you, like the physical product that you can open and close, whether mm -hmm. it's hardcover or paperback. So that's one. Then comes the ebook. 
So it could be a Kindle or a Sony or whatever kind of e-reader, e-book, not a PDF, because this is 2024, by the way. Even though some people <laughs> do still sell PDFs. I don't know how they do it, but they do. Mm -hmm. So that's two. Then comes the mm -hmm. audio book. That's already three. Mm -hmm. Now, if your book is as incredible as uh, two of the ones over your left shoulder, but to the right of the screen... Uh, up on that bookcase, then those can be broken out into a spiral bound. I, I say that for visual effect more than anything mm -hmm. into sort of a spiral bound concept and turn that into teaching materials. So, so like a workbook. It, well, not necessarily workbook. I, I just say it for effect. Like if you're going to stand before people mm -hmm. and train them based on the materials in your book, then call it seminars, seminar me or webinar material. Yeah. I know so how mean. many, so what do we get to now? How many, how many we have? We have four. Okay, good. I didn't get to coaching yet. Right. And so training is different than coaching. Yeah. And so now we're on five already. And it's the same material. You see, and so, and it's not, and it is not that we're, we're trying to, to somehow swindle people, mm -mm. but there is so much more value in a book when you have access to the author. True. Right. And so if we're talking about seminar, webinar training, if we're talking about coaching based on the materials. Now you have access to all of the answers and experiences that cannot be captured in the two, 300 pages. If it's a huge book, but you know, 170 some pages, you cannot encapsulate what people need to really move forward. The, the books are more inspirational unless we're talking about textbooks, but they're more inspirational and they, they get you going. They're informational maybe. But the transformation, I think, happens more time when you're able to have access to the people who are really behind the pen. That was a gem, y'all. Make sure to run that back and write that down. Like there's that difference between information, inspiration and transformation. Yes. Transformation comes when you have closer access to the author, which that's yeah. going to be important for you if you're the aspiring author. If that's the, the thing that you're sitting on right now, that hashtag luxury item. Like, imagine the value that comes when you complete the first version, which is the physical thing, and then ebook and audiobook, that's already three. If you choose to go spiral bound for the seminar, that's four. And then, you know, going into that fifth one, remind, remind everybody what that fifth one was, because that was pre-coaching. That fifth one was before the coaching. Well, I ha I dumped my dumped my brain, so I don't remember which one I said, but gotcha. but but yeah, uh, the the coaching seminar style. So I think we mm -hmm. covered it that way because we talked about coaching and seminar, and we covered three types where you can physically or ought to be yeah. aud aud auditorily hear the book. Yeah. So so there's that, and then of course you have keynotes. So that's a sixth sixth option. And then I didn't even talk about this when you and I were together on another call about actually mentoring people through or really coaching people through the process of publishing. Right. So if you've done this, you know, enough times, then then using your own experiences as a model is another way. And yeah. we're still just talking and we're not talking about reinventing material. We're not talking about new material. In fact, huh. I, I should be careful how I say this. So Ryan Levesque has a book titled Ask, and then mm -hmm. there's this long subtitle. Mm -hmm. And when I read it, I actually was annoyed, to be honest. Shout to Ryan Levesque, right? I was annoyed because I was like, but this is so elementary. Like, this is so basic. <laughs> there's nothing to see here, people. Mm -hmm. and then it was it, a bestseller, though. And then it, but then it clicked. I was like, that's the genius of it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, mm -hmm. I followed suit and wrote a book and uh, a book with the with the recycle uh, logo. I guess it's a logo in the front of my book, because really and truly, like one of my mentors would never write a book because he said, Dave, nothing I nothing I have is new. And it's like, but bro, nothing is new under the sun. That part. 
so it's t- it's 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 I think it's it's foolhardy for us to think that anything we we present is 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 fresh and new except that God gave it to us in our DNA but nothing is really actually new yeah. so when we put content with the DNA that that the creator has put in us we put that out into the marketplace that is the only thing that changes it the fact right. that it's Melissa T like She's the only Melissa T, but whatever you're saying is not completely new. There's no way because the ink is not new. Like the pages are not new. (laughs) None of the words are new. And if you made it up, you made it from some words that existed, right? That. But that, that is not, is not to say or suggest that we should not enter into the marketplace, whether it's as an author or some other kind of person in business because we do have a unique self to give. Right. And that's where it really matters. The me that I am giving to the people Mm -hmm. out there. Yeah. Yeah. So for, you know, for those watching, if, you know, the book is your particular luxury item, just be encouraged with that. Like you are the differentiating factor. It's literally you. That's right. You know what I mean? So it's the way you frame your story and, Here's the thing about framing your story. Please do not let your story monopolize the book. The, this is, this is what I share with folks, uh, David, and you can let me know if it's, if it's the right way to go. But what I say is choose the lessons you want to teach the people, whatever, whatever the key lessons are that you want them to come away with, and then support each of those lessons with stories from your life to back it up. Cause then that provides the extra meat in the book, but don't just let the book be your story. Like don't do that. Cause sorry, people don't really want to read that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, that was, you know what I mean? That, that was it's the challenge. takeaways they want. Yeah. That it's the takeaways they want. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was the thing. That's how we broke a lot of people's hearts early on where, you know, you may be, and I'm just going to pick random people. It could be George W. Bush. It could be, mm-hmm. Uh, Michelle Obama. It could be um, Martha Menezes. I don't know if she even has a book, right? Mm-hmm. And so these are people that a lot of people know. And then right. you say, well, I'm an author. I have a story. Then I can write a memoir. And it's like, yeah, but there's just kind of one thing, right? Nobody knows you. <laughs> that's that's right? the thing. That's and the a thing. lot of people know me, you know, but not to that degree. Mm-hmm. And so if I'm not thinking of them first, meaning the readers, then really I'm doing them a disservice because my story, I mean, okay, we've all had experiences, but something about the experiences of people that we quote know that Mm -hmm. are quote famous that sells because of what it is, but it's, it's, it's just because humans are accustomed to being voyeurs. Like, so yes, you're not going to peep into a nobody's window. And that's not to give me a complex. Like, it's just to say the reason why a lot of times people love to hear celebrity stories is because maybe we're aspiring to something. I don't know. But if you've never heard of the person, it's just like, huh, L. David Harris. Okay, yeah, his memoir. mm, I don't know. Let me know why I need this. And that's when you begin to pour into people's lives. And then it's like, okay, L. David Harris aside, this was really useful to my life. Right. Right. So that's the approach. You know, if you're with your book, if it's nonfiction, focus, build the structure of your book around the lessons you want the people to know, you know, mm-hmm. whoever your target reader is, build it around what the takeaways you want them to, to have. And those takeaways have to be takeaways they need. Yeah. That's the other thing to your point. It, it has to be something that's going to change their lives. And then back up each of those points with specific stories in your life that prove the points. Mm-hmm. Don't just fill it up. <laughs> Don't just fill it up with your story. <laughs> I'm going to discipline myself and just mute out until we move on. Cause <laughs> I'll have y'all here all day with that all day. Yeah. So, and, and thank you for sharing that because th- this is a conversation that I've wanted to have. Um, I've had the privilege of bringing guests on to talk about, you know, you know, boundaries as it relates to procrastination, boundaries as, uh, you know, beating procrastination through health, beating procrastination, your finances. 
but I'm like books is one like this is one medium that will absolutely never go away regardless of the type of book that it is whether it's physical ebook audio but especially now with audiobooks so people get to multitask and still learn while they're multitasking so this is a form of communication whether we you know think about it that way or not it's a form of communication that's never going away so if it's something, you know, for the folks that that's their goal, I really wanted to bring on somebody who has the experience in that. So real quick, what made you decide to create your own company, though, your own publishing company, though? I wanted to get into that from the business angle. This is almost like textbook. I mm-hmm. didn't like what I saw in the market. Mm-hmm. And I said, I'm an author first. How can I assist authors who will likely take a whole long time to earn a decent living in this field and strip out the things I hated the most about being a published author. One of the simple things that I didn't like was, and and, and listen, this is a business mod. This is a business staple. So don't Mm -hmm. get me wrong. Sometimes I go overboard, but a business staple is 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 getting quarterly reports mm-hmm. and income based on uh, money that has come in, cleared the books, uh, passed the refund period, and some other stuff, right? So mm-hmm. I'm not mad at it. I just didn't like it. So I didn't like waiting for a quarterly report and then looking at this spreadsheet and then looking, wait until I get to the bottom and say, well, what? how much of this is mine and why did I have to wait so long? And so what I did was I became a proxy in my publishing space Mm -hmm. for the author to get them closer to the distribution channel. Mm -hmm. So their income never hits my books. It goes directly to them. And so that means if the distribution channel is paying net 30 days, Mm -hmm. then the author is going to get net 30 days. But publishing companies like mine usually get that money and then on a quarterly basis, based on accounting, cut checks. Mm -hmm. But I said, okay, cut myself out as the middle person on the royalty money. So Mm -hmm. I earned zero dollars royalty. And most publishing companies of our type still charge on the front end. So I'm like, hmm, if they're charging on the front end and they're not earning royalty income, why do I have to wait for quarterly reports when I know that the distribution channels are net 60 or net 30? Mm -hmm. Put the author in the position to get net 30, net 60. So that was the first, the very first thing I changed is to put them in the position. The other thing I changed was having them to be in charge Now, I have a 50-50. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But have them be in charge of their own ISBN or that number for international sales that identifies your book in the marketplace. So rather than it being owned by Publisher X, you own it as the author. Because quite frankly, like, you know, nobody's naive, right? If your book is not published by one of the few big publishers, they know it's Mm self-published. The question is, is it well done? Is it well edited? Does it look good on the shelf next to the big publisher or big published, big publisher books? Mm -hmm. If the answer is yes, then nobody cares whose ISBN it is. Like nobody cares. If it says Melissa T, but it's in the system that identifies books to publishers around the world, then that means that any bookseller around the world can put your book in their stores if they choose to. And it'll show up in all of the public records around the world. And that's how I position my authors to not have to really, you know, if the record is messed up, then we have to wait for somebody at the publisher to go fix it. You have access to go get it fixed yourself before lunchtime kind of style. 
that's good mm-hmm. kind of returning the autonomy to the author yeah which I think is, yeah because if it's self-published just do it yourself like except for the quality part like don't do that because you're probably gonna mess something <laughs> up like don't do that Out, don't outsource do that, that yeah outsource that yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and just uh just to touch on for for our folks watching if you if you've never heard of isbn it's the barcode that's on the back of the book just so you know what that is and in order to buy it you would go through somebody like like L. David um, through his publishing company or someone like me who's a book coach. I can literally walk you through the website to go and buy it and how many you would need because each medium requires its own ISBN. So physical book needs its own. Mm-hmm. The audio book needs its own. The ebook needs its own. And even with the ebooks, like each different file type needs its own. So if it's for Sony, or some of those platforms, that's EPUB, that needs its own. Like each version needs its own. So you would talk to someone like me, someone like LDH, to walk you through that process to make sure that you are ready. More like Melissa T, because I'm coming out the game. I'm going to mentees and other really cool people. Because I've been in this game a long time. I'm tired. I'm tired, Melissa. I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. I'm tired. So I'm pushing all my chips into Melissa's lap and everybody and a couple of other people. And I'm I'm out of the game. I'm getting out of the game. Not because I don't love it, but I think there's a lot of space for the people who are still up and coming, man. Yeah. Awesome the deuces, y'all. So yeah, talk as we as we wrap up, talk about that. Like what are you working on now? You know, let our audience know about the new brand, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and you know what projects you've got coming up. Yeah. So I have three basic businesses. One is coaching. Mm-hmm. One it has to do with web development and design. And then the other is publishing. So the two, the web development and design and publishing, I've been in since the 90s. Wow. And, you know, I am focusing now on coaching. Full stop. And so Um, I had a meeting with one of my mentees today on the web development and design side of things to say, listen, Mm -hmm. this is what we're, this is what we're on. Like I'm, I'm on, I'm on pace to not have my hands in this thing so heavily anymore because my focus (laughs) is people now. I've been dreaming about this since I wasn't old enough to know what I was dreaming. Wow. Yeah. I went into the mental health field in 96 professionally i'm saying Mm -hmm. behavior modification and management and so in 2001 i started to get into uh behavior assessments and things related to behavior styles and so forth personality and so this is what has been my dream from from then and now that i'm in a position where i can actually do that solely if i choose Mm -hmm. to do it then I'm putting my chips in it. And it's, an, and it's a strange move, but I've made a lot of strange moves in my life. I have. That part. Yeah, but that's <laughs> what I, I don't love anything more than that outside of, you know, things related to God directly. Right. And given the fact that you're, you are someone that has been multi-skilled, multi-hyphenate, because there, you know, there are a lot of folks out there that are like that. What was your rationale in terms of going from career to career or from business to business? Like, was it, did you, were you someone that cast the vision very far in advance or was it more incidental for you? Like you connected with someone that was in another industry and you're like, this is actually kind of dope. Let me, you know, find my way into it. Or did you like cast that vision? It was like, okay, I love these four or five things and I'm going to time this out, like schedule it out. So kind of talk no, about that. No, no, as noble as it, I would like for it to sound. No, I just like to eat food when it's time to eat. And when, <laughs> when I was younger, I just, mm-hmm. I just became very good at whatever was set in front of me. And so it was really to earn and earn a living. And because I'm wired and created to do things well, it worked out. But I was mm-hmm. never fulfilled. And if I told you the number of things and the specific things, you'd be like, wait a minute, but there's not enough years in your life to have done these things. And so I have done a lot of overlap and at the highest okay. levels. Uh, but there came a point where it became obvious, though, post about 96, that mm-hmm. God was putting me in almost like a 
like you drop a paratrooper into somewhere to deliver supplies or to complete a mission or who knows what, right? And I became like this specialist in multiple industries that they would drop in different places. So years doing this with this set of people, years doing that with that set of people, and then shoot, I'm gone. And it's like, who was that guy? Oh, you mean <laughs> right. the guy that was here for 10 years? Yeah. Yeah, he really, he was a good dude, right? Yeah, gone. No trace. Like, people still look at me now, like when I'm at the supermarket, people are like, <gasps> and then they call me by name. You're here? Because I live in Jamaica. <gasps> You're Ooh. here? Because I did, I did four years in a situation like that, in, even in Jamaica. And it was like, well, we thought you migrated. I'm like, no, I didn't migrate. I just stopped doing what I was doing. And I'm not hanging around. Like, I don't, I'm not <laughs> bored. Like, I'm not, I'm not coming to the cab. <laughs> like, but that's what it was. It was like, God said, you will do this. Drop them in there. Boom. If it, is it two years? Is it 10 years? Is it 15? Is it 26? Mm -hmm. And then, shoot, when I'm done, I'm gone. On to the next thing. Yeah, so I don't I don't recommend that, by the way, uh, <laughs> right. by any stretch. But that's just the way my life worked. But now that you hear and you've you've been we've been around each other for long enough, I have so much to 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 offer people who are being coached because mm -hmm. I have not just touched but but functioned highly in so many things that I'm not guessing when I'm giving right. guidance. You can right. take it, leave it, agree or disagree. That's okay. But I'm speaking not just from a book when I'm help assisting uh, my coaching clients. Good point, good point. So take that if, if for you, if your luxury item is coaching instead of a book, definitely take what um, L. David is saying there and be fully confident in what you know. Yeah. You know what I mean? especially if you're multi-hyphenate, like feel free to patch together all of your skill sets, mind map it, like put it down on paper so you can see it with your eyes and see how you can blend your different skill sets together, your different knowledge bases together in a way that the market is looking for. Obviously do your market research too. Of like know what, know what the people want and create a product that they want. That way it's an easy sell. If you're giving Definitely. them what they what they need, then by all means, they'll be happy to take the money out of their wallet and give it to yeah. you. Definitely. You know what I mean? That's where I am these days. I'm not I'm not mm -hmm. about the bag anymore as much as I want to be a billionaire with a B. That's a B billionaire. Mm -hmm. But now it's not as much me manufacturing an industry or a product or a service in order to eat. Right. <laughs> It is, it is legit. That's why I'm, I mean, it's really a dice roll for, for people. Like if you feel like you're going to get up and become a coach and that's all you're going to do, strap in for like a long time of eating out of tin cans, right? Because the market is saturated. You have to, we have to be honest with ourselves about that kind of a thing. But Very I know true. that I'm, I'm uniquely called and equipped and skilled and positioned. And so it's not a dice roll for me. Mm -hmm. to do but but we have to be honest with ourselves and say okay if there's something that we really love and we have been dreaming about i told you it started for me a long time ago and it's only now that i'm in a position where i can do that full time very true that that sort of thing requires planning so if that is your luxury item make sure you're in different circles with either someone who is already a coach and coaching coaches mm -hmm. that is a thing that's a thing <laughs> or you know download the necessary resources or by all means like dm me you know what i mean because i can always point you in the right direction or comment below this if you're watching on youtube i can always point you in the right direction but ld thank you so much for taking the time i want to make sure to honor your time because <laughs> yeah, i know you have a hard it. stop yeah absolutely and you know i would love to have you back on yeah, eventually to kind of yeah to chop this up because there's there's even more to L. David than you guys have heard today. <laughs> and I would love to get into that another time. But appreciate you for coming on tonight. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my honor, quite frankly. I'm not bored, Melissa T. I'm not bored. <laughs> so I'm honored to that be with you. That's why I'm here.
Awesome. By the way, that's a whole shirt. I'm not bored. I love that. I'm not bored. <laughs> right? Like I got stuff to do, but, <laughs> but, but, but that means that I'm honored by you. And so thank you. Yes. And then lastly, where can people interact with you? I know you don't, you don't mess around with social media too much like that, but where can they get a hold of you? Learn more about the stuff that you're doing. Yeah. Put me in the Google. They know me. Google knows me. So just go ahead and uh, <laughs> get those quotes up and put L David Harris in Google and whatever you find that is useful to you. I think that'll be the best bet for you. Yes. By the way, yeah. it is L. David, y'all. That is That's his it. whole first name. That is right. <laughs> I think you may have seen my birth papers. Yeah. You did. Yeah, <laughs> you showed yeah. it. And I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, peace. Take care. Thank you so much for being on. Peace. Hopefully you enjoyed that interview. As you heard me say towards the end, we'll have L. David back on the show for sure, because he is a gold mine of guidance and information. Um, not only from the publishing side, but also the entrepreneurship side and even the personal development side. As you heard, he worked in um, the mental health, he worked in the mental health space for many years and is also a coach now. He's focusing on that. So if you've got any questions, if, you, if there's something you want he and I to follow up on in our next interview, drop that in the comments below as well. We'll be glad to dive into that on the next one. But if you haven't yet subscribed here, be sure to do that <laughs> at Getting the Win on YouTube. Uh, subscribe and hit the bell icon so you receive all notifications. You won't miss a single thing. And you can follow me on Instagram, Pinterest, and Threads at Getting the Win Show. At Getting the Win Show. In the meantime, I hope these tips helped you this week to get you started on that journey. If the book is your hashtag luxury item that you've been sitting on, or if coaching is your luxury item that you've been sitting on. Hopefully this episode provided you with some tips and some fuel to get you started or, you know, to continue the process that you began. So in the meantime, have a great Wednesday and a great rest of your week. Peace out. And be sure to check out the merch shop. If you are curious about the shirt, you want one for yourself, you can go to gettingthewindgear.com. That way you, you see this shirt, you'll see a bunch of other accessories as well. We've got hoodies, we've got sweats, we've got all the gifts that you could possibly wanna buy for yourself and for your folks to get the message out about being as productive as possible and staying true to yourself. Because the mission of this show is to turn procrastinators into producers. That's why I always task you guys to hashtag get on that and make sure you're on top of your luxury item. And that way you can rock the gear to remind the world that you are all about that luxury item. You are all about getting things done, getting the goals instead of simply setting them.